and welcome to this BFI London Film Festival Screen Talk with David Byrne. I am Terry White, the Editor-in-Chief of Empire Magazine. I'm thrilled to be here today with um, the man who is a musician, an artist, a writer, a filmmaker, um, and we are going to be talking today specifically um, about filmmaking um, throughout David's career, uh, specifically about this new adaptation of his hit, Broadway show, American Utopia. David, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for, for having me, inviting me to do this. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with the title, American Utopia. What does it mean? A small question, what does it mean? <laughs> a small question. It was actually suggested by a friend and I thought, oh my God, that's a, that's a kind of bold, audacious kind of title. Um, are people going to think that I'm, I'm saying that we're living in a, in a kind of utopia mm -hmm. or am I, is this going to be taken in a kind of wrong way? Or uh, are people going to think that, um, that it makes it too, say, US centric? Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of questions about it, but I thought in the end, I thought, no, we are going to address a lot of issues in this show. Uh, and, and visually and musically and through talking. And so I thought, no, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Uh, either, and it's not meant ironically. No. It's not meant like, it's, it's quite sincere. And it, so it's, it's kind of an aspirational utopia, although utopia is, of course, something that's impossible to achieve. Mm. But it's kind of an aspirational idea. Of how can we kind of step a little closer to that? And do you think there was a surprise for people in the sincerity? Did people automatically assume it must be ironic um, or playful in a way that you didn't intend it? Yes, I think given my past work and the way people view what I do, the people assume that it must be ironic or I must be kidding. Um, but then when they see the show, people who have seen this film, they realize, no, he's quite serious about this. And, and is it, would you say it's, optimistic yes yes for that's what i gather from reactions of other people mm. um it's joyful uh hopeful optimistic in the sense that well there's an awful lot of work to do mm. um it's not optimistic in the sense of everything's going to be just fine uh, it's kind of like we've got a lot of work to do but it's things are not impossible and do you think, because it doesn't have a, a, I suppose, a conventional narrative plot, but there's certainly an arc. How would you describe the arc? Um, well, in retrospect, I think it revealed itself as we started to, was, as it began as a concert and then got refined and, and kind of the arc was kind of emerged and then was kind of emphasized a bit more. I think it's an arc of... Uh, a person, I would be me, um, mm. who is very much inside himself. The show begins with me holding a brain. Um, and then this person kind of emerges outside of himself and kind of finds himself uh, a little community of people that help, help mm. him psychologically and physically and all this kind of thing. And then the audience sees everybody working together. And then that community begins to engage with the larger world. So it's this, these stages of a, a, a person's journey. And I hope it's not, I mean, I use myself in some ways as an example, but I don't think it's unique to me. No, and obviously um, we, none of us could have foreseen the global pandemic this year. Do you think there's some kind of um, parity in that journey? Because I feel like as society, possibly the world is going through a journey from potentially I to we. Exactly. And I think, uh, yes, the, it's been said before, the pandemic has kind of pulled back the curtain and mm. revealed a lot of things that have been festering for a long time and need, need attention. And if, if we're lucky, maybe they'll get that attention now. And do you think we're also looking at how we're connected? Because the, the show and now the film, it is about connections and, and our strength together. But obviously, we're having to rethink how we connect. You know, I'm talking to you now over 
the internet. We're not in a room together as we would be normally. Um, do you think there's that element to it as well, looking at the way we connect with each other throughout society? Yeah, you kind of, the, the audience witnesses that with the various band members, uh, how everyone kind of works together and everyone gets to be a, a star at, at various points. Um, it's not, well, not always a strict hierarchy. There's mm. everyone, everyone is needed. Um, and we've seen that with the pandemic that uh, there's been this real struggle, especially in, in the United States, a real struggle between kind of the idea of the individual versus the collective. And mm. do we kind of, can we actually do better as a whole if we work together or do we stand our ground and say, oh, oh no, I, it must, it's my way or the highway. Um, I know where I stand on that, but it's a moment where kind of that kind of issue is coming to the fore. And I don't think it's an, an accident that uh, the, at least here, that Black Lives Matter and the attention that's being given to those issues mm. is happening at the same time. And just talking a little bit about, you, you mentioned the other band members. So you're on stage with 11 other musicians. Is that right? Is it 11? Yes. Yep. It's yeah. 11. I make it uh, an even dozen. And how is it? And it is, and you've, you've talked a little bit before about how it's untethered. And obviously there's constant kind of movement. Can you talk about why that framework works so well for this idea? Well, it all just emerged bit by bit. I, I, I'd done things before where, say, I'd worked with a brass section in, in, on stage, and, and it's not uncommon for, like with marching bands, that a brass section can uh, not be tethered to microphones or risers or any of that kind of stuff. And I realized we can do this more and more. And I thought, could I do it with the entire band? <laughs> could I kind of liberate the drummer? Well, I can, but it, would mean, it means having six drummers in order to achieve that, that kind of whole sound of a, a drum kit and, and percussion. I have a key, I, can I do a, have a keyboard that wanders around as well? Yes, you, that's possible now. Um, so I realized that by doing this, this is, it means a lot of wireless channels, a lot of technology kind of that's invisible behind the scenes, um, that it meant I could have an empty stage I could clear everything off. No mic stands, uh, no risers, no sets, none of that stuff. The set is basically uh, the emptiness. Mm. And that to emphasize that emptiness and make it, make it visible, make the emptiness visible, I had to kind of frame it. So I, I discovered that I could use a kind of lightweight chain curtain, uh, kind of a three-sided box. For, and, and so the, audience that's what the audience sees they see see us um, inside this kind of three-sided chain box uh, and everything we're the only things there there's no other stuff in there mm. so it uh, in, a, in a way it becomes about all about us um, it's all about how we relate to one another how we relate to the audience um, it's and the audience, and the, I think the audience realizes that. They realize that what they're looking at, what they're looking at is people. Mm. And uh, they're not looking at stuff. They're looking at people. And uh, it has, that has a huge impact. Well, and people with no shoes. Um, yes, and people with no shoes. No shoes and wearing the same outfits. Um, uh, was that, again, about, about the kind of democracy you were going for on stage? Or was exactly, that a really yeah. aesthetic thing? Yep. Uh, yeah, it's part, a little bit of both. Um, <laughs> I thought that having everybody in a kind of uniform, in this case, a kind of gray suit, it makes us a kind of team. We're, we're, we're a little team, a little tribe, and uh, we're unified that way. Nobody mm -hmm. stands out more than anybody. Everybody's dressed the same, so nobody stands out really more than anywhere else. But then given that they were suits, I thought, uh, oh, I'm not going to have us wear big, clunky uh, business shoes um, that might look smart, but it's, it's going to be very, that's going to inhibit things a little bit. So I thought, let's see if we can do it barefoot. Um, and if, let's see if our feet can hold up to yeah. that, <laughs> which, which for the most part they did. 
which for the most part they did. Some people were a little bit more reticent than others, yeah. either because of um, arch problems or germophobia, but uh, it all worked out. Clean stages. I'm sure clean stages were, were yes, a necessity. They, yes, they do have to be mopped down before we do our <laughs> <laughs> And if we go back to, to where it started, it was obviously an album initially, um, which obviously you performed. I, I saw it in London in, in I think, 2018. Um, and so what was the step from it then becoming a Broadway, a Broadway show? Um, shortly after we started the concert tour, I heard rumors that Broadway producers thought this show could be, could work on Broadway. I think they'd, they'd seen the success of the Springsteen show, which is mm. very, a very, very different thing. But they thought, oh, oh pop, pop music can work on Broadway. Oh, oh. Ah, what a th what a thing! <laughs> um, and uh, so there was some interest, and that kind of churned around in my brain. And so at the end of the tour, I thought, okay, let's see if we can make this happen. This will be interesting. It's a completely different setting. Mm. The audience comes with different expectations. Um, you have to. I thought I'm going to have to adapt the show to make it work in that context. Uh, a Broadway audience is unlike a concert audience, they're not really up for dancing by the third song. They, they want a little bit more. They've got some nice comfy seats. Yeah. And, and they want to take it in, understand what it's about, decide whether they like it or not, mm. before they're willing to kind of give it up and, and can start dancing, um, which they do. But... Uh, yeah, so I realized that rather than being a liability, this becomes an opportunity. I can, mm. It means that I can kind of talk with them more. I can kind of gradually introduce how, what the show is made of step by step, and I can kind of emphasize that arc a bit more than I could in a concert where mm. the audience really, they, you know, it's like, get us up and moving as fast as you can. Yeah, and how did you choose the songs from throughout your career to put in the show? How did they work with the arc? Well, there's, there's, I knew that I was uh, pretty much obliged to put in a few popular, quite popular numbers, but luckily I have maybe enough of those so I could kind of cherry pick them and, and so that it kind of fit the arc. So I could mm -hmm. kind of start with uh, songs that kind of seem to be from the perspective of somebody who was very kind of, inwardly directed and gradually kind of build out uh, from there and pick songs as, as best I could that seemed to reflect that. And when it did come to making it into a film, and it is, I have to say, it is in much like um, some of your previous work, it isn't, I wouldn't say it's a recording of a concert, it's a film in its own right. And obviously a huge part of that is Spike Lee, who obviously directed this film. So how, how did that come about? And did you already know, you know that you wanted to make this, this piece of cinema and you spoke to Spike, or how did, how did that come about? Uh, I'd, I'd either heard or I had an idea that there might be a possibility of turning this into a film. Um, and so I'd known Spike not well, but kind of we came up in kind of in parallel, we'd crossed paths a number of times. So I reached out to him and said, Spike, we're doing some out of town tryouts in Boston, kind of getting the show into shape. Uh, and there might be some interest in turning it into a film. Do you want to come and see it? Which he did. And by the end of the second show, he said, yes, I'm in. I want to do this, which was great, which is great. He, and uh, he came to, I don't know, seven or eight shows Wow. before we started filming so that he knew the show kind of backwards and forwards very intimately. Um, we'd, we'd be playing and, and we'd just look out and go, oh, there's Spike, he's dancing in the aisle. <laughs> <Yeah>. Again. <laughs> yes, again. Um, it, was a, it was a great feeling. And so between Spike and his, um, his DP, Ellen, Ellen Chris, they they made a plan of how to film different songs, how things would begin, 
how to capture this moment or that moment. It was, it was very much planned out. Mm. I mean, obviously there were some accidents, happy accidents and things that happened, but a lot of it was really planned out of how, because there's so much movement on stage, it's really about capturing this kind of choreography and this movement when the band shifts from one side of the stage to another, or when they come mm. from upstage to downstage and you want to cap capture what that feels like. Um, it's, it's not a bunch of static players kind of standing and shaking a bit and playing their instruments. There's an awful lot of things going on. I mean, was it storyboarded? Was it kind of planned to that degree? Not to that degree. It wasn't storyboarded, but it was kind of, I guess you could say, conceptually storyboarded, where mm. it was say, oh, this moment in this song, we're going to catch this with this camera. Mm. Um, this moment, we're going to do this, we're going to do it this way and that. And so it was, yeah, very, very much planned out that way, but not quite storyboarded. And how many, was it like Stop Making Sense in that you filmed over multiple nights to kind of... Uh, get the film you want or was it one night yeah there was multiple nights there was two, i seem to recall two shows two separate shows um and then sort of uh pickup shots like half a show to get shots where we could have the the cameras uh on stage where we wouldn't do that during one of the other shows because we would have a live audience and we didn't want to see all these camera people wandering around <laughs> And, and how kind of close to the, to the line did you get with lockdown? Was it, because I was thinking the timing, it must have been quite close to lockdown. <laughs> it was pretty close. It was pretty yeah. close. I don't know. It might have been three weeks between when we filmed, then the show basically, it was scheduled to close or at least go on hiatus for a while, which we did. And then we did a television program here and, and, um, and then the lockdown mm. happened right after that. Uh, we were very, very lucky. Um, we managed to get all this in the can mm. before that happened. And did your collaboration with Spike kind of continue in the edit? How involved were you kind of post-production? Spike invited me to come see edits and sound mix and this and that and the other. Uh, he very, was very generous that way. But I was, for the most part, very happy with what he and the editor, Adam, did. Mm. And so I, I mean, at some point, uh, I remember when they started editing, I asked Spike, let me know if you, if you, if you, if you think maybe a song should be cut, mm. or if you should maybe change the order, which you can do. You have the luxury of doing that. He didn't. He said, no, you've got something that works. We're going to mm. try and make this work too. And obviously we've talked about kind of connections and, and individualism, but there is also obviously a resonance um, in terms of you cover a Janelle Monet song. Um, and famously, uh, there are names called out during that song. It's the names of people of color who were killed by the authorities. Can you talk about why you kind of wanted that in there and, and how Janelle Monet felt about about um, you doing that song? This is a song that comes right almost at the end of the, the show. Mm. And as I said, because there's this kind of arc, and this is very much uh, kind of a kind of civic engagement, engagement with the larger world and the various issues from the community that the band represents. And uh, I'd often in, in my shows done a kind of lighthearted cover version at the end um, just so the audience could kind of let off steam and have fun. Mm. Uh, but in this case, I thought we're living in really, really kind of treacherous times. And we're living in times where uh, we kind of, as citizens, we have to engage with uh, all these issues that are out there. We, we have an obligation. We can't just kind of duck it and say, okay, let's just have a good time. We will have a good time. We, are, we do have a good time. But at the same time, part of that is this kind of civic engagement. And I'd heard this song that she had done with some collaborators. And I found it incredibly moving. It's, it's not a 
didactic kind of protest song. Mm. It pretty much just names the people who've been murdered and asks you to remember them. Remember these lives that have been taken, that these, each person has a name. So I, so I thought, can I do this? Could I do that song? And uh, so I wrote to her. I happened to have her email and uh, said, what do you think of a, you know, kind of a elderly white man doing this particular song? And she loved the idea. So, mm. so I thought, okay, <laughs> we're going to go ahead and do this. And Spike, uh, for the filming, reached out to families of these people who have been killed, whether it was wives or mothers or uh, other family members. And they, they became part of it as well. And, and you're talking about this civic engagement. Do you think the arts, you know, as well as being a mirror in times of, of great kind of unrest or global crisis or however you, you want to phrase it, do you think there's a responsibility for the arts to engage? Yes, I think there's a responsibility for the arts to reflect the, the times that we live in, the world that we live in, to be a mirror that we can look at and see ourselves. Um, I think the arts can be less than successful when they try to be didactic, when they try mm. and preach and uh, try and tell us how to think about things. But, but the arts can are very good about opening us up to kind of the possibility of different ways of thinking, the possibility of uh, looking at ourselves in a different way. Mm. And so things, they can, it can affect change in that way. Uh, yeah, I've often asked myself, well, I can't, I, I, I'm not able to write a song about kind of specific policies or- No. Yes, about alternative energy or whatever. That, that'd be a little hard to do. And, and would you say you've avoided being, I suppose, is political the right word previously in, in your work? Maybe in, in, I've, I don't think I've ever done it as directly as I have here. But at mm. the same time, I think someone else said this, that every kind of act like this, in the, any kind of public act like this is, is political in some way. Mm. Um, Sometimes it's political in that just what you, what you present to people, um, even if you're not making a kind of didactic, dogmatic point, how you present yourself and how you present the group and everything like that, that sometimes makes the political statement. And obviously people talk about Stop Making Sense as the great uh, concert film, I suppose it, it's often called. And... Is it true that um, Spike and Jonathan Demme were friends? Yes, Spike and Jonathan were friends. Um, there was a point during the filming on this film where Spike looked up at the ceiling while he was out there in the audience and said, Jonathan, how are we doing? How are we doing here? <laughs> yeah. I mean, was it, it must have been in your head during the kind of making of, of American Utopia. Um, in, only in the sense, I suppose, that it raised the bar so much and is, is so beloved. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm aware of, aware of that kind of thing, that uh, there might be comparisons, but uh, you know, you can't let that hold you back. You can't be afraid to do something because it's gonna be compared to something good that you've done in the past. Mm. Um, the, the response to the, the concert tour and the Broadway show was, was very, very good. And, and it, it implied that I'd somehow made, in, 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 the way, in the way that that concert, that show, that film, was a kind of breakthrough in how to mm. present music, the, the sense that I got was that people felt like, well, he's kind of done it again. He's, there's another, here's another way of doing this. Yeah, it felt like a continuation to me um, yes. of, of the conversation you began before. Um, and so let's go back and let's talk about Stop Making Sense. Um, so how did you first meet Jonathan? Where did your relationship begin? I met him through a friend of a friend. I was th I, again, I was thinking, oh, this, this uh, show that I was doing, the Talking Heads were doing, uh, was... I thought it's kind of cinematic. It has, mm. again, it has a beginning and a middle and an end. And it changes throughout. 
and so I started thinking, uh, oh, if I could find a director who might want to shoot this, then uh, I might be able to find the money for it somehow. And a friend of a friend, <laughs> uh, uh, as often happens, uh, connected me with Jonathan, came to the show and yes, said, although he had a lot of other things going on, yeah. said, yes, I want to do this. Yeah. And, and why did you particularly um, kind of, why did Jonathan appeal specifically as a filmmaker? Oh, uh, this was, uh, yeah, for put it in perspective, this is well before, say, Silence of the Lambs or mm. Philadelphia or some of his kind of more well-known films. Uh, and I'd seen his early films and really loved them. And what I felt was that he, you, you really feel an empathy for all the different characters that are in his films. Some of them are kind of eccentric. Hmm. Some, not everybody's a good guy, but you really feel an empathy for all of them. And I thought, this is something that he's going to bring to, to the filming of this show. He's going to see this as kind of an ensemble film or ensemble theater piece or whatever. Mm. And um, which is what he did, which is kind of not, not the biggest tool in my tool, toolbox. <laughs> <laughs> but it was something that Jonathan does kind of second nature. Mm. Uh, and I thought that's what, to me, that's what made uh, that film work as well as it did that uh all the the band members you got to know them all you got to see how they reacted with one another and, and, and so you, they were all like characters in a, mm. in a film yeah and when you were kind of talking to him about the film because it is unlike any film of that type had been before did the two of you kind of come up with a shorthand for having the same vision for Stop Making Sense and, and why it would be so different to, to any other kind of concert film? Wow. <laughs> for, the, for the filming, um, Jonathan had, these, had a great idea that uh, he would film first from one direction, then the other thereby kind of avoiding the cam seeing the camera work. Mm. Uh, you also had this great idea that you shouldn't see the audience. He wasn't going to do cutaways to the audience until near the very end. Um, often there are, in concert films and things like that, there are cutaways to the audience and you see people cheering and clapping, which in a way is telling you as an audience member, this is how you're supposed to be feeling. Yeah look, these people are having a great time. You're supposed to be having a great time too. But he realized, no, we're not going to tell people how they should feel. Uh, and until maybe the very end, when hopefully the viewing, the film audience is already kind of reached that point where they, they, they're feeling the same way and you can show that there are other people dancing in the aisles and all this. So that, yeah, I was definitely in agreement with all that. And Jonathan was incredibly generous and that he uh, invited us, the band, into the editing room. Um, because we knew the, the show so intimately. We knew that here's a moment where this, this person kind of mm. does this bit of a dance. This was a person where this person does a kind of special flourish or whatever. And so we could kind of point that out and go, oh, there's a, there's a thing going on right here. And if you have a camera that, that got it, you, there might be something interesting there, um, which was very generous of him. Yeah, and you, was it, is, is it correct that you were involved in, very heavily in the aesthetic, the staging, the lighting, um, stage design? Were you kind of very across those, yeah. those details? Yeah, it, uh, again, it was pretty much a, a film of the, the show that we were doing, which that was what it was. It was, a show that showed you how a show is put together. It starts mm. with an empty stage and then all the various bits come out, whether it's amplifiers or drum risers or the lighting, the screens, everything kind of comes out one thing at a time until you've seen all the elements arrive, all the players and 
instruments and everything. And then it all gets put into action. Mm. Uh, very. And so that was, that was part of the concept. And the other part of the concept was not to use any colored lights. Um, I don't know why that is exactly, but I, I realized that different kinds of lighting instruments, whether it's uh, sodium vapor lights, uh, fluorescent lights, tungsten lights, they all have their own color. Yeah. They, they, we, we see them as white in a way, but they all have their own color quality. So I thought, just let them be what they are and let that provide the various, the kind of, the very the different, the changing color moods of the thing. And so as you say, he didn't invite you in the edit. So how kind of involved were you in the edit? As you say, were you there to kind of help in terms of the chronology or, or the narrative thread or, or were you feeding back on specific things? Um, and was that kind of, did that give you a bit of a taste for, for filmmaking? Yes. Um, uh, our input into the editing was more kind of a, as helpers, I would say. He was generous in that we would, as I said, he would, we would say, oh, there's a bit where Edna does a really nice, really cool kind of dance thing right here. So if you have a camera that caught that, that might be a good thing to grab right there. Mm. Uh, so it was more about us kind of knowing the show kind of inside and out and all these moments that happened and we could point them out rather than kind of, kind of imposing our will on how he was going to put that together. Um, and yes, I had done, uh, I had directed some music videos before that. Um, which is a very different thing. Of course, they're only like three minutes long or whatever. Mm. But seeing this process going from 35 millimeter film to ed the editing process and the sound mixing process, I realized, oh, this is, now I see how it's done. And Jonathan was generous enough to kind of allow us into the, that whole process, um, which, of course, doesn't usually happen with actors. Yeah. They're, they're often uh, kind of, they get to see it at the end when it's all done. Uh, but it made me a little bit familiar with the process and not, not so frightened of it. So I thought, oh, I might want to have a go at doing this now. Kind of step up from doing music videos to doing something a little bit larger. Mm. And had filmmaking been something you'd been interested in? Obviously, you move around mediums, you... Uh, you're not just a musician um, you dabble in lots of things I use the word dabble but you are pr proficient and um, wonderful in lots of things and, and had you ever had the kind of ambition at any point earlier in your career or as a, as a, as a kid? Yeah I loved film? films uh, I was introduced to kind of I guess what you'd call art films or European films or other kinds of films when I was uh, at art school and which just kind of blew my mind. Yeah. I'd, you know, I'd never seen anything like that growing up. Um, didn't like them all, but they were all, they were all like something I had never, had never imagined before. And I realized that film can be a lot more than what I'd seen at the local cinema where I grew up mm. or on television. Uh, so it was all very exciting. And I see that this, this could all feed into Thing. It was, you know, it was like, it was like hearing rock and roll or whatever for the first time. It was like, oh, a, a world has opened up mm. here. Um, and you start to get to a little taste of it when you're working on music videos in that way. Of course, music videos are kind of famous for borrowing a lot of things like that. Uh, and yes, so I thought, oh, yes, I'd love to do this. I wonder if I could I wonder if I could do something, and I, I had an idea of, I wonder if I could do something that kind of integrated music into it, but in a different kind of way. And it told a story, a kind of musical story in a different kind of way. So I started thinking about making, yeah, making a fiction film. Um, I approached one of the films I, I loved was uh, Robert Altman's film, Nashville. And he loved it as a film, but I also 
was kind of excited by the idea that it was a film that didn't have a conventional narrative structure. Um, it had it had a thread. It had it was leading to this event that was uh, that was going to happen, but it didn't have the kind of conventional kind of uh, three act yeah. structure and tension between the characters that, that would normally happen. So I went, I got in touch with um, Joan Tewksbury, who wrote the script for that, it, for Nashville and other films. And uh, I, I thought, I asked her if uh, we could work together on something. And she said, no, <laughs> no, but, but, but <laughs> <laughs> which is fine, uh, but, but, but I'll help you out. Here's some people you should meet. There's some, peop there's some people in Texas that you should meet. Um, and she talked to me about how, kind of how she was working on films like that, how she was mm. thinking about uh, how the emotion from one scene can, can bridges into the next scene, even though it's a different place and with different characters. Mm. And I thought, oh, I, I, okay, okay. I don't quite understand it, <laughs> but I think I, I get a little bit of an idea of how that can work. And and this is true stories, right? Yes, which, yeah, which, yeah. So which that, we are which we are going to get go into in great detail. But um, I'm interested in in you're talking about this kind of epiphany, I suppose, where you discovered a whole new kind of cinema. And can you remember whether any particular films or filmmakers, um, Robert Altman aside, who really kind of, can you remember that moment when you thought, oh yeah, this isn't my local um, cinema. This is, <laughs> this is a different language. Oh, there was so much. Uh, there, was, uh, there was some, uh, of course this was, this would have been early seventies, uh, just to put a time frame in it. So there was kind of like the, uh, Bergman films, there was um, Fellini films that were coming out then, there was Japanese films, um, Seven Samurai, this kind of thing. Um, there were, there was kind of more kind of experimental art films, or it might be uh, like a Jordan Belson, I think, is the name of one of one of those mm. filmmakers of just very abstract stuff. Um, Maya Darren, there was a whole Jonas Mikas, Andy Warhol, all these. There was all there was a whole world of different approaches to to film, and not that I kind of thought, oh, I want to do that, I want to do that. But some of them were just like, oh, that's a possibility, but that's not that's not for me. Yes, so there was Godard, Truffaut, oh, you know, there was so many, so many. And it, yes, you realize, oh, there's a lot of mm. lot that's been going on that I had no idea. Mm. And did that kind of transform your wider cultural landscape? And did it then influence kind of your music? And, and presumably that shifted, you know, not just your view of cinema, but, but potentially your view of art and the arts generally. Yes, yes. You realize that this is, a, this is a, another kind of medium and with the kind of uh, opening up of music videos, whenever that was, late 70s maybe, mm -hmm. mid to late 70s, well maybe it was a little later than that. You, you realize that um, here was a format that uh, they were gonna let Almost anybody who could put something together mm. that would last three minutes and have the music in it, they were going to start to put it on the network. They would start to, you know, broadcast it. Uh, it didn't have a large audience at first, but you realize that th this was a kind of a wide open area. Um, there weren't a lot of gatekeepers because they needed mm. content badly. And so that was a real opportunity and it worked. And I remember that uh, the, I, from my point of view, one of the early Talking Heads singles, Once in a Lifetime, um, it kind of broke through MTV as a music video, being not just being played on that channel, but they would play, play the videos in bars or mm. music clubs or whatever. You'd, I remember going into bars and music clubs and there'd always be a big 
TV screen or whatever, playing videos back to back. Mm. And do you think there's almost, as, you, as you're talking about, an accessibility through those short form videos, which then yeah, the, potentially led yeah, you on a path? Absolutely. Uh, there was myself and lots of others were, who were also inspired by all these films that we'd seen, whether it was experimental films or um, kind of also non-mainstream cinema, were kind of incorporating those ideas in a, a, sometimes <laughs> in a kind of grab bag mm. kind of way, but sometimes coming up with something quite new, sometimes mm. coming up with a new kind of sensibility uh, inspired by these things. There's an artist who, who did films, Bruce Connor, that I, uh, whose kind of experimental films using found footage were uh, very influential to a lot mm. of people. Um, but that may, once you found that you could kind of do this and that, that it was, wasn't uh, on that small scale that you could do stuff and, and kind of play with things and put it out there and then do another one, do another mm. one. It, yeah, it was very exciting and it made you kind of forth say, well, now can I scale this up a little bit? Yeah, and was that, you know, you were an accomplished musician and artist, but was there a part of you that, that felt like it was still a closed off world when it comes to cinema? When you have the idea for your first feature, as you say, that's, that's quite a different thing. Did you get the sense that you were trying to break into something? Ah, a little bit, yes, a little bit. But a lot of the people around me were very supportive. I worked with the cameraman, Ed Lockman, who'd worked with uh, film vendors and a lot of other people and, and who was very supportive. Um, very open to the director, that would be me, to kind of come the peculiar ideas I might have about how to film things. Um, there'd be some resistance, there'd be some people who go, oh, that's not the way you do that. Mm. And sometimes they were right, and sometimes mm, I think they were not right. Sometimes they were just doing it the way it had always been done. But uh, I was very lucky at that time, Talking Heads were had had some successful songs uh, at a certain level. And so that gave me access to, well, money and an audience um, that I wouldn't have had earlier, earlier and probably didn't have later for a while either. And, and as you say, coming from outside the film world, not having been to film school, or do you think that actually freed you up to think about your first feature? in a different way because the, the rules weren't there. You know, you weren't aware of the rules that everybody else may be kind of following. There's a bit of that. There's a bit of that uh, of the rules are there to be broken or being naive uh, gives you kind of, you have this sense of, oh, I didn't know what the rules were. So mm -hmm. I, I, that's why I'd made something different. But I was also doing my, be my very best to try to learn how things work. I, I'm in my office now. I have books about editing and books yeah. about uh, all that that I loved. I, I mean, I just loved seeing how scenes from kind of well-known films could yeah. be broken down of how they were cut together, how they how the kind of storyboarding was done, and all these kinds of things. So I did a lot of storyboarding. Um, yeah, it, I tr I did try to educate, although I didn't go to film school. I did. <laughs> I was quite serious about trying yeah. to learn the craft is sometimes by doing with music, with music videos. And so let's talk about your idea for, for true stories. So it came from tabloid stories, but I was actually reading that it began with images that you put on your walls. Exactly. It's a, um, I'd worked with a theater director, Robert Wilson, who does, who's, uh, whose productions are very, very visual. They're kind of gorgeous. And having worked with him, I realized that he starts by collecting images. He kind of thinks about what kind of world are we gonna talk about? What are the characters? What are the people in it? And he just uh, kind of starts filling these walls with all sorts of pictures that might reference that, or might be inspirational to that, or might serve as an inspiration. And I thought, oh, I get that. Um, so I started the same way, just 
uh, either drawings that I'd done or pictures that I'd pull out of magazines or books or whatever. And I'd pin those to the wall of my house. And then I realized that I wanted to find a thread mm. that would tie all these things together. Um, that they had a, and so I, uh, <laughs> I was amused and fascinated by these uh, eccentric stories, uh, eccentric characters that had been written about in these tabloid newspapers. Um, a man who kind of advertised for a wife and put up a sign in his yard looking for a wife. I didn't check to see how true these stories were. Mm. Of course, they were reported as fact, uh, but you know, those tabloids, well, take yeah. it with a, a little kind of grain of salt. But I thought, uh, I'm going to act as if they're all real. And so those, uh, and let's see if those could be the characters. And then how can we kind of tie them all together? And what images were you pulling out? Was there anything you discovered that was kind of thematic about the images? I love the idea of, um, I'd gone on lo location scouting, uh, recce to Texas with some friends and writers. And I love the idea of this kind of flat landscape, mm. uh, often with no trees in it, and maybe just a house or uh, a, a kind of warehouse church or whatever, stuck in the middle of a flat field or something. I thought, this is, that is so amazing. It's so, there's something very special about that. So I started doing drawings, collecting pictures that I'd taken of those things. I remember a, a drawing of uh, an overhead shot of a, a woman sleeping in bed, having a, a kind of talking in her sleep. And I, that never made it to the film. But uh, <laughs> and there was yes, lots of things where I have, uh, I think I have one still stuck on my wall now of um, there was a, a woman who was obsessed with her genealogy. And yeah. so the, in one room of her house was just completely filled with family pictures. Um, and this was a real thing. This was not a tabloid one that happened to be yeah. a real picture that I'd seen. And I was also inspired by uh, a lot of the kind of emerging color photographers whether it was uh, Bill Eggleston or Joel Sternfeld mm. or different, different people whose work was kind of becoming more visible as color photography in the kind of art world, let's say, was becoming more accepted. Mm. And so from this, this idea, how did you develop the kind of narrative through line, I suppose, which would be the celebration of, of specialness and, and you're, and you're a narrator, right? That's, that's a kind of a cohesive, no? Yeah. That word? Cohesion. I, didn't to, I didn't want to be the narrator, but, but uh, oh gosh, it, it sort of fell to me to do it. Um, there was a, a kind of well-known weatherman that I, I, I tried to persuade the film producers. I think, could, could we get this, this oh. weather, this weather guy? He's, he just looks like an everyman. He would be good. Um, but no, it fell to me. Um, so why, I, did, why did you not want to do it? Well, I didn't want it to be about me. And I also didn't feel like my acting. I'm not an yeah. actor. Um, but I guess I had a, a peculiar point of view of my own that some of that maybe helped a little bit. Uh, Jonathan Deming, again, was very helpful. And he said, um, if you don't have a conventional narrative, you need what he referred to as a clock, mm. um, which is kind of what uh, Nashville had, the movie Nashville. Uh, so in this one, the, we had this kind of, what we called the celebration of specialness, which was based around, I think, the sesquicentennial, 150 mm -hmm. years of founding of the country. And uh, so it was kind of local talent show. And I thought everything's gonna keep mentioning that. So everybody knows that this thing is coming up, people getting ready for it. They're, working on it there. So you're building towards something. So, okay, so that's, that's useful. Um, and then I worked with uh, some writers, Stephen Tobolowsky and Beth Henley, mm. uh, to kind of begin to construct a kind of 
narrative between the various characters and how they might interact with one another and how they might cross paths. Um, sometimes it was me as narrator who would take, introduce a character and visit them. But in other words, sometimes it was one of the other mm. characters that would connect with one of the other ones. And I thought, okay, we can, let's try and do that. And then every, uh, I realized that maybe every 10 or 15 minutes or so, we need, we're gonna need a song. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a musical. So we're gonna need a song. So I wrote a bunch of songs uh, based on the, these characters mm. or based on the situations that were, were emerging. And I tried to write them in, in some ways, representing all the different musical styles that could, you could uh, hear in Texas. And, and so was it really the three of you who, who wrote the script? Were you very heavily involved in the writing of it? Um, oh, gosh, yeah. They did, a draft, <laughs> they did a draft, and then I kind of tore it to pieces and kept parts of it. Um, mm -hmm. But we all stayed friends. Um, it was <laughs> and, and did you have to um, uh, pitch for funding? And, and then, as you say, you had a team of producers. And did you, was there any kind of difficulties in terms of staying true to your vision for what true stories would be? Because obviously, when you make a film, there's, there's, there can be many execs involved, um, lots of notes, and, and you know, lively conversations, I suppose, about, about certain decisions. Um. As I said, I was in a very, very lucky position where Talking Heads had had a few hit singles, and I guess Stop Making Sense had done had been yeah. out by then, and so I thought it was a feeling that um, people were going to support me yeah. in what I wanted to do, which is, yeah, of course, very rare. It was, of course, not a, not a very not a huge budget. Yeah. Um, I worked with a producer, Ed Pressman, who had done some interesting films, Badlands, and mm. I think he did he Days of Heaven, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, he'd done some interesting films. Uh, a line producer, Karen Murphy, who had done Spinal Tap and some other films. <laughs> and, but yeah, between them, they were very understanding of kind of preserving the artist's vision. Mm. Um, and I, I wanted it to work and be accessible to people. I wasn't about mm. making a film that was just going to be so bizarre that nobody would get it. I wanted it to be accessible. So I, I agreed to say test screenings and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, which in this case meant that some scenes got cut, things yeah. got arranged. We did some reshoots, uh, some people who, some characters who, uh, I thought were, really interesting people the audience didn't like them mm. um and i realized oh okay i can fix that with just a few lines um it's, it's amazing how sometimes how little it takes to turn around the perception of a character and mm. um, was there anything in in those um groups you're talking about that the, those test screenings that surprised you um or you found really difficult to kind of to take it and change the film because of, of what they said? Uh, well, it's always, yeah, it's always difficult when some scenes that you've thought are, were just beautiful or strange or wonderful, you realize that's not essential to the story and it's probably going to have to get cut. Mm. Of course, I, I didn't want everything to be just cut so that it was just story, story, story. But mm. I realized that sometimes if you can detour away from the story too much, the audience would kind of wonder where, where are we going? Yeah. Um, yes, there were things like um, in the original version, um, it ended with a wedding and then a funeral. And the, the audience didn't like ending with a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> they did not like it. Um, <laughs> and so I realized, no, okay, emotionally, the ending actually happens before that. So we yeah. have to kind of get out of it, get out quickly. And, and how did you feel about the reception the film received? Um, it was, it was well received in um, Britain and Europe mm. and elsewhere. In the, 
In the U.S., it was sort of well-received. Texans loved it. Mm -hmm. um, but in many cases, as we talked about earlier, the, um, the, a lot of the folks in the U.S. thought that I was being ironic and thought that I was making fun of these characters mm. and kind of looking down on them, um, which I didn't think I was. Uh, and I thought that Texans have a kind of the ability to laugh at themselves as well. Mm. Uh, and they can be pretty eccentric. So I thought, no, this is the way, this is the way they are. Mm. And um, so there was a, a little bit of a, a kind of tough reaction there in some quarters, but gradually I think that sort of faded away as kind of a younger audience started to discover the film. Mm. And such a, you know, wonderful group of actors. And John Goodman is just wonderful. Oh my film. God, he sure went on to great things. Yes. <laughs> but he's, I, I just think he's, he just dazzles in this yeah. film. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was amazing. He was never happy with his own performance. Very, you know, as many actors are like that, where they, they always feel they can do one better. Mm. But he did incredible, yeah. Mm. And so you have made other documentaries, I think, too. Um, yeah, I did one, one in Brazil. I did one in Brazil. Yeah. I don't think those are available yet. Um, they came out on DVD, but then, yeah. But not uh, another feature. No, no. I have, I, I've had ideas that didn't pan out, but uh, you never know. It's, it seems like um, it's, in a way, uh, easier to do, maybe, now, to actually make a feature. Mm. Um, technically, I mean, you, the... You don't need big 35 millimeter cameras and yeah. you, you can kind of do a lot of editing on your home computer and this kind of thing, which you couldn't do before. Mm. So that's, that's a huge difference. Um, but then getting, getting that scene, it's sometimes getting it, even just the limited budget that might need for that. It can be tough, but I'm not complaining. I think I've, I, I tried and I may try again uh, yeah. I didn't succeed, but I, uh, I had other, whatever other things I could do. Yeah. So no, I, it's not like you've been stuck around, is it? It's, um... Yeah, yeah. It's not like I was oh, kind of just faded away into nothing. I thought, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, uh, I'm not having any luck here. I'll write an album and, and kind of yeah. do some shows. And, and do you have kind of one big burning idea for a feature that you'd like? I'm not, I'm not saying tell me it, but do you have one that you'd, you'd like to be realized? Yes, I do. Um, I can't figure out the third act though, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, that could be exciting. And let's, let's end, um, oh, it's been so lovely to talk to you, but let's end on reasons to be cheerful. Um, Cause I think this is a really fascinating project. Ah, oh, thank you for asking. That's very nice. Um, a number of years ago, not too many years ago, uh, before the last U.S. election, um, I realized that uh, I was getting kind of somewhat depressed and anxious and aggravated by kind of the news that I'd read every morning. And so I started collecting, as a kind of antidote, I started collecting things that gave me a little bit of hope and sense of possibility and just collect them on, on my laptop and I realized after a while I'd accumulated quite a few of these so I started writing them up uh, and posting them online and then about a year ago I decided to be a little more professional about it and I uh, put together a little team or some collaborators editors writers and they have writers that they yeah further afield and web designers and social media person and all that sort of thing. And, and kind of, we do it, we do about three stories a week um, on things that have happened around the world where someone has done some, solved a problem uh, and has succeeded at it in a way that is, you know, very inspiring. Yeah. So we're not interested in, we're not interested in kind of good ideas. 
um, not to denigrate good ideas, <laughs> but we want things where the idea has been put into place and has actually been successful. Because then we can say, look, this place or this person or this community has done this. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody else can take that as an example. Well, thank you so much for such a lovely hour of conversation. Thank you. And thank you for American Utopia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David Byrne.